He's taken six. Okay, no, you're taking five. The equivalent of five. Four absences, two latenesses. I'm sorry. This is a math class, too. Oh. Six and four. Six and four. Sure. This is, uh, there's a certain amount of relativity in math these days. Sort of quantum math. <coughs> We just started the uh, Crito, and we're at uh, 4D4C5. What has happened over this point in Crito? Not very much, except Crito has started to give uh, what will turn out to be a very long list of reasons why Socrates should escape. Reasons why both of you should escape. <laughs> reasons why Socrates should escape. And the first two reasons are pretty bogus. They're all having to do with, oh, it's, it's like Crito is whining to Socrates. Oh, Socrates, it would be so terrible for me if you died. And Socrates is saying, shut up. But here's what he actually says. He says, my good Crito, why should we care what the majority think? What Crito has done, and as I said, Crito often sort of speaks as if he is a, a representative of the majority. He probably is in the sense that he probably is much more a conformist kind of a personality than Socrates was. He's a good friend of Socrates, but it doesn't mean he <coughs> shares the same sorts of values, or maybe generally the values, but he, he tends to be considerably a, more of an a intellectual lightweight and maybe even a moral lightweight. So when he says, well, everybody will speak, speak badly about me if you don't escape, um, he, Socrates, then says, what do you care about what everybody thinks? What do you care about the majority thinks? They, uh, you know, they don't know anything. And so, if you're going to care about what people think, care what, pe what intelligent people think. Don't just care what most people think. And, um, and, and Crito sort of says, well, you know, uh, the majority can, can, can get you into mind. And he says, well, look, if, if the majority can really do great evil, that would be good. Because then they could do great good as well, uh, in the sense that they could, uh, they would either would have some sort of a, 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 a focus to their uh, to their thinking. Socrates' view is that the majority, most people, have no focus to their thinking whatsoever, and they're no better en masse than they are individually. So you just get a whole bunch of people with no focus together, and you don't have anything better than one person with no focus. So he said, you know, if they could do the greatest evil, that means they'd be capable of some sort of focus on a principle. Because then, maybe with good leadership, they could do great good, focusing on a different kind of a principle than <coughs> leadership. But he says, they can't do anything like that. They're just random. They're just haphazard. And so we don't pay attention to them. This is sort of a uh, one of uh, Socrates' criticisms of, uh, of democracy, almost hidden underneath every comment he makes about the majority, or about most people, you can find really embedded there uh, uh, a criticism of the democracy, a criticism of why democracy fails. It fails because the people don't want it to fail. The people only want to just sort of uh, pull stuff out of their butt and call that governing. And so it's uh, not exactly distant from our democracy today. This is uh, about the Athenian democracy, but you can probably make some inferences about that. <coughs> they talk a little more about escape, money, all that kind of stuff, and uh, until finally, uh, Crito decides, well, I've got to do some more convincing. It seems <coughs> as if Socrates is not ready to pack up his bags and come with me. So at about 45 C1, he gets back, Crito gets back to listing the things. This really becomes almost like a list. A list of things that should be good reasons why Socrates should escape. One thing you'll find <laughs> is after that little interlude between uh, 44 C5 and now here at about uh, 45 C1, uh, in that interlude when they talk about don't listen to the majority, uh, step up your game, Crito, and all that kind of a thing, Crito really does change a little bit. The reasons he gives seem to be less self-centered and sort of narcissistic and more reasons about what might appeal to Socrates. And sometimes these are really, even in some sense, uh, uh, moral critiques of Socrates, something almost no one ever does, unless you're a good friend, I guess. 
giving a moral critique to Socrates seemed to be something that put you, put you way out of your league. Uh, Crito, maybe because of the desperation of the time, is not afraid to give a moral critique of Socrates. It comes pretty interesting. But here's, here's what we'll call the third. Uh, again, you don't have to number these. I've numbered them in a book just to make it sort of easier. But generally speaking, you don't have to know the number of them, but just sort of uh, uh, generally what, what's, what Crito was trying to argue and how he was trying to get uh, Socrates to change his mind. So at C1, he says, uh, you'll be welcome in many places which you might go. You can go to Thessaly. I have friends there who will greatly appreciate you, keep you safe. But so that no one in Thessaly will harm you. So he's saying, if you leave, you've got places to go. And he sort of is implying, remember, you're the great Socrates. Everybody wants Socrates in their town. Everybody wants Socrates to live here. It, you know, he's the smartest guy in the world. Why not have Socrates? He would be a, a, a sort of a, a benefit, of, a, a boon for the, for the community. And so... Go to Thessaly, or go to Thebes, or go to Megara. There are lots of places you could go. Um, probably don't want to go to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> Sparta, but you know, maybe Sparta's pretty well governed. Uh, at least the kind of government that, that uh, Socrates likes. So he said, you know, this, you, you'll be welcome. So it's not like you'll have no place to go. You'll be welcome anywhere you go. Then he says, besides Socrates, I don't think what you're doing is right. To give up your life when you can save it, and to hasten your fate as your enemies would hasten it, and indeed have hastened it as their wish to destroy you. So he, he says, fundamentally, you shouldn't give up your life if you can save it. Now, of course, this is sort of contrary to the Socratic view, but um, Crito has his own point of view. The Socratic view is, don't worry about what happens to your life. Worry about the kind of quality of life and, and, and the kind of character you have. And if you have to give up your life in order to preserve your character, that's a good trade-off. You shouldn't give up your character in order to save your life. But Crito has a slightly different view that there's something wrong with giving up your life. And what he is saying here, sort of, uh, again, sort of an underlying theme here for, for Crito is if this was an unjust trial with an unjust verdict and an unjust sentence, then you shouldn't be giving up on this. If this is unfair, you should be fighting injustice. You should be fighting injustice and escape, live to fight another day, make your case, be a living example of the injustice of the Athenian. System. But he says, you don't do that. He says, there's something, there's something just uh, morally, uh, morally questionable about a person who doesn't do that. If they've been treated unfairly, if they've been treated with an injustice, you need to bring that injustice out into the light. And you can't do it if you're going to be dead. I mean, you'll be dead. The injustice will have won. And, uh, and then what will, what will that mean? So, it's, uh, you know, a you know, reasonably interesting and also a fairly... Uh, uh, pungent kind of a, <coughs> said, a moral critique of, of Socrates. Ilyich. Uh, not worrying about like your life in the sense of the Socratic method, was that something also in Stoicism? Like, like you know how Stoics, like, the, what, what's it called? Stoic? Like people who live like by, what? Stoicism. Stoicism. There you go, my bad. Stoicism, was that also like a tenet of Stoicism? Like, not yeah, Stoicism. Stoicism. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 and pretty much so. That uh, that one of the first things you have to confront, say, Stoics, is uh, uh, the temporary nature of existence. Yeah. Once you understand that, then you can only then, if you accept your own death, can you live a life. If you don't accept your own death, then you'll always be uh, making up excuses for not doing anything. It's as if, well, I'll, I'll have time later to do that. Stoicism says you don't know how much time you have, and it's always going to end. So what you've got to do is live as fully as you can now, and particularly with a certain kind of, let's say, moral <coughs> fullness, a certain kind of fullness of character. And so the view that uh, uh, that life is, is something you already are uh, running out of is, is a Stoic point of view and, and a Socratic point of view as well. And the Stoics like Socrates in part for that, that particular attitude. <coughs> Let's see. Moreover, I think you'll be betraying your sons by going away and leaving them when you can bring them up and educate them and things like that. So, sort of bringing the, pulling the, the, the family guilt strings, saying you, and, and the father was thought to be the person in charge of raising sons. The mother was thought to be in charge of raising daughters there in ancient Athens. And so, it would be unthinkable to have the mother raise the sons. And that would have been thought just, you know, he's going to turn into mama's boys or whatever it's going to be. And so, uh, it's better to, to be here to, to turn uh, the boys into fine manly men. Uh, 
And so uh, he sort of, again, sort of pulling the guilt strings there uh, at about D5, he says, you seem to me to choose the easiest path. Whereas once you choose a path that good and courageous men can choose, particularly when one claims throughout one's life to care for virtue, then this is sort of hitting below the belt. What he's sort of accusing Socrates of is being a hypocrite. You, you preach about virtue all your life, and now when it takes courage to stand up to this, you're being a wuss, you're being a coward, you're doing nothing. You're laying down in front of, uh, in the face of evil and doing nothing about it. Instead of fighting and living to fight another day and continuing to, to, uh, to preach and to live a life of virtue, uh, which includes the virtue of courage, he says, now what you're doing is you're just, uh, you're wussing out. You're just laying down, you're being complacent, you're uh, just not confronting evil as it comes to you. And he says that for a person who preaches virtue all his life, to then turn around and not live the virtue when his life is at stake, he says, uh, he seems to imply, this is somewhat shameful on the part of you, Socrates. Another moral, you know, a moral critique of the great moralist, Socrates, which seemed like a rather interesting thing for him to do. Um, However, he goes back at, at E1, says, I feel ashamed on your behalf, on behalf of us, your friends, lest all that has happened to you be thought due to cowardice on our part. Now, there's a little story behind this. It's a story that, um, that I have Stone uncovered and, and was pretty well known, or at least fairly well known at the time. Robert Waterfield, who wrote a, wrote a great book about uh, the death of Socrates and the trial of Socrates, comes up with the same information, that the trial didn't have to take place, that on on both sides, there were people <coughs> on the prosecution side and the Socrates side. There were people counseling, uh, trying to come to an agreement. Don't let this come to a trial. Don't let this become public. Let's, if there's a beef between these two sides, let's settle it in private and come to some sort of a compromise where this happens and this happens, and, and we don't have to make it a public trial. Uh, certainly, there were people on the prosecution side, not the prosecutors themselves, not Anatis or Melitus and why not. But people in their camp generally says, you know, this could be a black eye for Athens. This could make, you know, this could be worse than taking out Socrates. Taking out Socrates may be a good thing. And if you're on the prosecution side, you probably agree that it is. But taking out Socrates, though, it's a good thing. It, it could have a whole lot of backlash for you as the prosecutors. It might be that, first of all, you may not win. Second of all, people will think that you're, that you're being presumptuous and rash to uh, dare challenge this fine old man. Uh, and there could be a whole lot of you know, bad things that could happen as a result of a prosecution. And Socrates' side, the same thing, Crito, uh, Cretabolus, Plato, there are other people as well who had advised Socrates, just, you know, let's do a, a deal with, the, with these guys, because you don't want to go up there and be publicly humiliated and forced, like sort of a common criminal, forced to defend yourself in front of everybody. So were there, on both sides, there were people counseling the principles uh, finds a way to deal with this rather than make it a public trial. The problem was both of the principals were stubborn bastards. The uh, Melitus, Anatus, and Lycon had their orders. They were really nothing more than stooges for uh, political power groups within Athens. And the political power groups said, get rid of Socrates by any means necessary. And so they had to continue on because they were essentially uh, uh, ordered by their group that this is what you've got to do. I mean, people around him said, see if there's some way you can sort of compromise here. And likewise, on Socrates wanted the public forum. He wanted to confront it, because mostly he wanted to be able to talk to Athens in some public forum in a way that people would pay attention to explain who he was, what he was, why in these 70 years he's lived, he's been misunderstood. He wasn't going to give up this opportunity you know, to uh, present himself to the people of Athens saying, you got me all wrong. This is the kind of person I am. This was an opportunity he would never have had you know, before and will never have again. He's, uh, he's stubborn. He's not going to give that up. Likewise, the prosecutor's not going to give up. And there's probably a lot of thought that someone like Meltis, who was young, inexperienced, uh, working for, I don't know if he's working for a politician, maybe working for the artist, but a young and inexperienced that Probably getting a successful prosecution was his way to make his way up the, you know, the organizational chart. He'd make his bones, so to speak, by getting rid of socks. And so uh, he certainly probably was ambitious enough.
to want to say, hey, I'm going to stick in here no matter what, because this will get, you know, this will make my name. Ironically, it did make Malthus's name, but it didn't turn out to be what the name he wanted. He was looking for a name like Flowers, because uh, he was a he was a thief and a robber. No, he, he was uh, trying to make his name as uh, the prosecutor of the great Socrates, hero of Athens, and suddenly there was a backlash. It came about a year or two after the trial was over, and Socrates is dead, uh, and the backlash came that, uh, that particularly Melitus, who was sort of the public face of the trial, became sort of a public humiliation of the trial. He really thought he was going to uh, sort of make his name and move up into political life, and it turns out he was uh, really shamed and, and just about disappeared from, uh, from, from the Athenian life. So it didn't work out very well. But that's what this little thing is saying. People will, people will think that, uh, or people who, who don't know us will think this whole thing could have been, could have been solved <laughs> with a little therapy or, or uh, some sort of conciliation or something of that sort. So that's what Crito is talking about. It's alluding to the idea, we tried to get you to do it, Sox, you stubborn old bastard, and here you are. <laughs> Look at what happened. You're here, you're in the slammer, you're going to die unless you escape, and this didn't have to happen. So that's uh, a little bit of what uh, was a part of the scene in that time. And, uh, and then his, uh, let's say, his final plea there at about 46A3, consider, Socrates, whether this is not only evil, but shameful both for you and for us. Again, it's a, a sense that not only was this verdict evil, what not only was, you might almost say, it was a trial and a whole prosecution with evil intention behind it, but it's shameful, both for, for Athens and for Socrates, to just let it stand. We can't let it stand. This is, it was wrong, if you're not guilty of any of these things, everything we know about you means that this is an unjust situation and to just lay down for it and give up is shameful on your part. And people probably will say to his friends, why didn't you spring him? Why didn't you get him out of here? Why didn't you talk sense to him? Well, <laughs> talking sense to Socrates is, of course, a, a, a hopeless case anyway. But uh, that was uh, you know, that was sort of what uh, that last thing was about. So at about B1, 46B, uh, Socrates, sort of after Crito has to pause to take a breath, uh, Socrates sort of comes <laughs> in here and said, well, you really, you know, you must have had a couple cups of coffee this morning before you came to see me, because you're really wired up here. And actually what he says is that, you know, you, uh, you're sort of enthusiastic and you're full of, of energy and passion about this. And he says your passion's good, except passion is good only if it's directed in the right way. If you direct pa passion toward a good goal, then the passion is a benefit. You direct passion toward a bad goal, and the, pa and the passion, no matter how strong, can do a lot more harm than anything else. So he's saying that if we're going to use your passion, you really want to convince me of this, then let's make certain we do it in the right way. And so what he is doing, whether he, he really explains it or not, Socrates is sort of going to lay down the ground rules, uh, you might say the question and answer session. The question and answer session And then he went to the artists and the musicians, and he said, what a bunch of assholes. <laughs> no, it will. Uh, the, uh, what Socrates is doing is saying, we've got to lay down the ground rules. He's not saying that precisely. But what he is saying is that if we're going to engage in an inquiry, it's going to have to be a rational inquiry. If it's going to be a rational inquiry, it can't be just open-ended. We have to know what we're aiming at. And we have to know uh, what kinds of, if not restrictions, at least what kinds of boundaries what kinds of criteria we're going to use for, uh, for engaging in this, in this inquiry. And so he doesn't quite say it that way, but it shakes out that that's what these next few lines are about, setting up the criteria. You might say the boundary conditions. He'll sort of call them principles, but they're more sort of the principles of the inquiry, more than moral principles, because he'll come up with moral principles later, and that'll, that'll be important. But for right now, these are just the principles of the inquiry. He says, uh, this is about B3, I'm the kind of man who listens only to the argument that on reflection seems best to me. I cannot doubt that this fate has come upon me, discard arguments I used. They seem to me much the same. So he, he is sort of already now saying, and he'll, he'll reiterate it in a bit, that 
a part of the thing we're going to do is only listen to the best arguments, only listen to the best reasoning, the best thought, the, and we have to find out what the sources of the best thoughts are. This has a, a, a two-pronged effect. One is, of course, that's what Socrates wants. You have to use the best reasoning or you're not going to get the best result. But there's a second prong to this. He is always trying to defuse Crito's reliance on the majority. Socrates is a great enemy of relying on the majority for reasoning, for arguments, for ideas, for thoughts, for anything. He knows that Crito often seems to think, well, what will the majority think? What will everybody say? He wants to uh, make certain that that doesn't become a part of the process. If a part of the process, Crito is going to say, well, let's, uh, let's ask everybody and, and see what they think, whether you should escape or not, then uh, Socrates don't want any part of that kind of an inquiry. So it's already sort of cutting cutting out of the herd the opinions of people he doesn't really think are reputable. The majority are not reputable, therefore the opinions of the majority are not. So that's sort of part of the way he's sort of saying procedurally, here's how we're going to go. We're going to look for a good, good answer, but the good answer is not going to come from just any you know, bubble head with a, with a butt. It's going to come from uh, people who know what they're talking about. And then right after he says, I value and respect the same principles as before. And we have no better arguments to bring up at the moment. I'm sure you, uh, I should not agree with you, uh, such and such and such. But the idea that uh, the same principles we had before is really the second part of these procedural things. He's saying we need to be, or I need to be at least, he's saying, I need to be faithful to the principles I've always held to be right. By principles here, he's talking more about values, of sort of moral principles. So really he has here, though he hasn't said it in quite these explicit ways, it works out that's the way it is. That he has set up these two boundary conditions, you might say. That we only listen to the best arguments, and whatever the result is, whatever we come up with, it must be consistent with the values I've always held. And if the values I've always held are consistent with escaping, I'll escape them. If the values I've always held are consistent with not escaping, I won't escape. And of course, the procedure we'll use will be uh, uh, listen only to the best arguments. But now, in this listen only to the best arguments, he needs to spend a fair amount of time uh, trying to convince Crito that that means none of this majoritarian crap. Uh, and so, what we're doing here next is sort of going through that whole uh, that whole thing. If we look at him trying to convince uh, Crito of that. And if you look at 47, a little before 47B, a line before that, he said, Come then, what up statements such as this? Should a man professionally engage in physical training, pay attention to the praise and blame of opinion of any man, or uh, to those of one man only, namely a doctor or a trainer? Oh, those to only one only, he says. <coughs> you can see this is very much like the horse trainer analogy from the, from the uh, Apology. That uh, the horse trainer analogy is: Do you let anybody train your horse, or you choose someone who's professionally uh, uh, competent and have them do it? Of course, the, the, the inference is you let the person who knows what they're doing do it. Well, the same the same principle applies here. The same the same kind of an analogy. It's not about horses; it's about <coughs> training. The same sort of an analogy. If you uh, if you're going to try to get uh, opinions that that are valuable about a particular subject. You have to listen to someone who knows about that subject. And the opinions of everybody are often worthless in a subject that requires expertise. You would think that something like uh, the moral question about whether it's right or wrong to escape is a sort of a question for at least maybe a moral expert or at least someone who knows about morality. And so you might have to say that just everybody can't come up with a decent answer about that. So Socrates is spending a lot of time with Crito reiterating in lots of different ways, it's we've got to have good arguments and good reasoning and good opinions, and they don't come from the majority. And uh, so that's what he is doing there for, for a great deal of that. So I think uh, I'll just sort of gloss over that and go to where something slightly different comes in. And that something slightly different comes in in 48... Uh, uh, let's say 48b2. And my ad will offend that argument we have gone through remains, I think, as before. So the conclusion that you know, we'll just listen to the best arguments, we're not going to listen to everybody, and, uh, and let's assume that we were both in agreement on that. 
So that's having been said, he says, I think, uh, examine the following statement in turn to see whether it stays the same or not. That the most fundamental thing is not life, but the good life. <clears throat> By the good life, meaning not, uh, you know, wine, women, and song necessarily. That can, that can be a part of the good life, but it can be sort of only a, a, a marginal attraction. The good life is a life of character, a life of morality, a life of fulfillment, but fulfillment at every level. Uh, the idea of fulfillment as a, as a spiritual person, as an intellectual person, as a physical person, as a moral person. And you know, there are lots of different areas of our existence that being fulfilled but guided by both reason and virtue in that fulfillment is what the full and complete life. That's what the good life is. And he says uh, uh, that the good life, the beautiful life, and the just life are the same. Does that still hold or not? It doesn't. Uh, when he talks about the good life, he's talking about the various parts of the good life, all of which are developed and fulfilling to you, and, uh, and also are a benefit to the world that you have in contact with. So he is again making the distinction between longevity is not admirable if it's at the sacrifice of a good life. A good life, even if it's short, is to be preferred over a long life of essential emptiness and meaninglessness. And he believed meaning uh, comes from the fulfillment of all these different areas in your life. You can't really leave any one out, any part of your area out, because there will always be that vacuum, that, that lacking there that you will notice. And so both you know, relational happiness, occupational happiness, physical happiness, intellectual happiness, all of these things have to be a part of the good life for, for Socrates. And so he's reminding us that, or he's reminding Crito, that if if whatever comes up, this is sort of a way of alluding to, uh, this is a, a kind of a value. This is not specifically going to be one of the values he's going to target, but it's going to be a general statement of, of, a, of, a, of a life of value. A life of value is the good life, and it will contain these kinds of things. So any decision we make must be a decision that is consistent with the good life. If it's not consistent with the good life, then all it does is add weeks or months or years to life, but doesn't add beauty and importance and goodness and virtue to life. That's not worth it. It's not worth it. Particularly if it, in fact, erodes or takes away those kinds of qualities. Quality versus quantity. For, for Socrates, it's always quality, all the time. He's lucky. He has had a high quantity of life as well. But for him, uh, quality is always the thing you're aiming for. So uh, then he says there at about a little before C, 48C, he says, as we've agreed so far, we must examine next whether it's right for me to try to get out of here. And the Athenians have not acquitted me. If it's seen to be right, we'll try to do so. If it's not, we'll abandon the idea. So that sort of is sort of uh, okay. We're ready to start thinking about it, aren't we? But then he immediately goes into some of the objections or some of the reasons that Crito gave for his escape and sort of dismisses them out of hand. He says, as those questions you raised about money, reputation, the bringing up of children, he says, that's, that's, you know, those are peripheral issues. Those are not core central issues. If the, if the issue is, is it right for me to do this, then those other things are not going to illuminate us on whether it's right for me to do this. The only way we can understand whether it's right for me to do this is to, is to investigate the values that make it right or make it wrong. Uh, these other things, he says, they're on the margins and they don't really count. So uh, at least he's sort of dismissing them out of hand. As he says uh, uh, at about C6 for us, however, since the argument leads to this, the only valid consideration, as we're saying just now, is whether we should be acting rightly in giving money and gratitude to those who will leave me out of here and helping ourselves with the escape, or whether in truth we should be doing wrong in all of this. So he says that uh, that's all we have to know. You don't have to know these external things. And uh, then he starts, and this is really, I think it's a really nice smooth transition because he's been talking about the good life and then uh, about, uh, well, to decide whether it would be a part of the good life to escape or not. And then he sort of segues here at 49, about 49A4. Uh, he says, do we say that one must never in any way do wrong willingly or must one do wrong in one way and not in another? is to do wrong never good or admirable. As we have agreed in the past, our bodies form our has been washed out in the last few days. So he's saying that is, uh, is, it, is it 
ever right to do wrong? Is it ever wrong, right to harm someone, or to, you know, to do things of harm, or to, to be an agent of harm? And uh, so he, he says there at about B5, uh, uh, is wrongdoing in every way harmful and shameful to the wrongdoer. Do we say that or not? We do. So one must never do wrong. So he's now talking about moral issues here. He's not talking about practical issues about who we listen to. So this is really going to be the first of what you might call the moral principles or the moral values. He says, I'm going to stick to my principles. But he's now saying, here is a value or a principle that I think is relevant to this question. I mean, he has a lot of values, a lot of principles. Socrates lived a long time in many areas of his life. And uh, in his moral life, he, he can find a whole lot of moral principles that he thinks are important. But he wants to pinpoint those which are specifically relevant to the question, should I escape or not? I mean, there are other ones that are going to be relevant to other issues, but they're not other issues that are being questioned. The issues being questioned, should I escape or not? So he thinks this is one important, relevant thing. Don't do harm. Harm no one. Do no harm. Sort of the uh, Hippocratic oath. This is do no harm. And so he says, and, and, and he says also that in that line above there, that it's harmful and shameful to the wrongdoer. So when you do harm, it's not just that you're intentionally trying to make someone else's life miserable. You are harming yourself. You're making your own life miserable because what you're doing is you're eroding your own character. Your character deteriorates as you engage in harm or engage in wrongdoing to other people. And so you, you really end up, you think that, he'll talk here in a minute about payback. You think, well, payback, that makes everything even. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back, now we're even. And Socrates said, no, there's no payback. That makes it worse, it doesn't make it better. Because what happens is, when you pay back, you're still intending, intentionally, to harm someone else. But now you are being harmed by the very act of being a harm giver. By being a harm doer, you yourself are being harmed. And that didn't happen before, necessarily, when you were wronged by someone else. So you're inflicting on yourself harm that wasn't there before. So this is a, you know, this is a, makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. It doesn't even things out. It just makes it worse. It makes it worse for you. And uh, at this point, it's your character that really needs to be, uh, you need to be paying attention to. So one must never do wrong. Certainly not, says Crito. Nor must one, when wronged, inflict wrong in return, as the majority believe, since one must never do wrong. That's a you know an important thing. He says if let's say one art, one part of the argument, one claim is one must never do wrong, then you can't then have another premise of the argument saying it's okay to do wrong if you've been wrong. Uh, what you say it's okay to do wrong, then you you come into conflict or you contradicted one of the premises of the argument, which is one must never do wrong. This is what the majority believe that it's okay. Payback and retaliation is fine, uh, and and you can hear Crito says. Well, that seems to be the case. In other words, he's not saying right on Socrates. He's saying, well, I guess that's the way it is. He's sort of lukewarm about no retaliation. It seems clear that he's sort of a, a, a payback kind of a guy, and Socrates is not. So Socrates has to, and then the next few lines, uh, continues talking about this. You know, if someone injures you, uh, you don't have the right to, and it's, it's not a, a, a wise thing to do to retaliate. So the next few lines are all about that. Uh, and so we get to 49E, um, about 49E4, Crito finally capitulates, finally gives up and says, okay, okay, I agree, I stick to it, and I agree with you, so say on. He says, okay, I'll agree with you, no retaliation, our principle is going to be do no harm. So that's moral principle or value number one. Then I state the next point, says Socrates, or rather I ask you, when one has come to an agreement that is just with someone, should one fulfill it or cheat on it? One should fulfill it. So not, not much discussion needed in that. They seem to be in agreement there. If you, you keep your agreements, if you give your word, you keep your word. Uh, you know, no, you know, under no condition do you do you cheat on an agreement that you've made? Do you go back on your word if, it, if you give it your word as a pledge? That. That's just the way it is. And that's, again, one of the values, one of the moral principles or values that Socrates believes that if we're going to stick to our principles and, and that whatever answer we have must be consistent with our values, that these are the two values, Socrates says, 
that are relevant to the inquiry, relevant to the question, should I escape or not? And those are, do no harm and stick to your agreements. So if that's the way it is, he says, now uh, let's see what we, can, uh, what we can do. Let's ask the big question. So he does at the next line, uh, right before 50. Uh, see what follows from this. If you leave here without the city's permission, are we injuring people whom we should least injure? And are we sticking to a just agreement or not? And Credo just doesn't understand how this is relevant. He says, I don't know. And Socrates realizes he has to, as he you know, did with uh, Youth of Rowan, a previous uh, thing, he has to sort of change his tactic because he wants Credo to understand this because he wants Credo <coughs> to be an active participant in the discussion. But Credo doesn't quite understand how these two principles relate to escape or no escape. And he actually has, a, and he has another thing happen. This is just, to me, the most wonderful part, one of the most wonderful parts of any of the dialogues that Plato wrote, is this, uh, the last section here, which is the last section, a few more pages left of the dialogue, the last section in which Socrates realizes he has to introduce another character to the dialogue. But there's only two people that are in the cell, him and Crito. But there needs to be a third person. And so Socrates is going to make up, speak up, uh, speak as, uh, as, uh, as this third person, because he realizes so there's another, you might say, another stakeholder in the process. I mean, there's, you know, Crito, he's going to give his point of view, typically the majoritarian point of view. Socrates, he has his own point of view, having to do with maybe his, his high, you know, high flute morals and his standards and his uh, character. But he says, you know, there's, there's another interested party that we're not speaking for. And that's the party called, well, the city, the city of Athens. The city of Athens has a stake in these deliberations, he believes. And yet, he's not speaking for the city of Athens. He's speaking for Socrates. Crito is not speaking for the city of Athens. He's speaking for common knowledge, uh, the uh, man the street kind of stuff. So somebody has to speak for the city of Athens. And so he, uh, he makes up his character. And for most of the rest of the dialogue, uh, the main character now becomes... This invented character, Socrates is going to speak the lines, but it's going to be a character which he will call the laws. And, uh, so we'll move right through it. See. Look at it this way, says Socrates. If I was, we were planning to run away from here, or whatever one should call it, the laws and the state came and confronted us and said, tell me, Socrates, what are you intending to do? I mean, the laws of the house are the thing. You know, explain yourself, Socrates. What, you know, what, what's this mean, this escape? Do you not, by this action uh, you are attempting, intend to destroy us, the laws, and indeed the whole city, as far as you're concerned? Or do you think it's possible for a city not to be destroyed if the verdicts of its courts have no force but are nullified and set at naught by private individuals? So there's sort of the opening salvo from the laws that you will be destroying us because you, you will set a precedent saying that the, the verdicts of the courts, the laws of the land, have no force uh, if... if People decide not to. Uh, that you can you can just sort of uh, walk away from them with impunity, without having to say, "Well, and, uh, the laws apply to you, but not to me." And so he's he is saying, "How do we answer the laws there? How do we answer this question uh, about it? What should we answer to this and other such arguments?" For many things could be said. And now, of course, this is Socrates speaking in his own voice. Typically, uh, there'll be things in quotes, and that'll be Socrates speaking as the laws. Things are not in quotes, be him see, speaking as Socrates, and then Crito will be saying, hmm, huh, 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 huh. And so that'll be so Crito speaking for himself. So he says, uh, for many things could be said, especially by an orator on behalf of this law we are destroying, which orders of the judgments of the court shall be carried out. Shall we say an answer? The city wronged me and his decision was not right. Shall we say that or what? Yes, my Zeus, Socrates, that is our answer. Well, finally, Crito was excited about something. The city wronged me. Because the city wronged me, then escape is a justifiable thing. It was a bogus trial. It was a, uh, a trial that had no, uh, nothing other than <coughs> meanness behind it. And the verdict was cruel and inhuman. Everything about it was bad. I was wronged by the city. Therefore, I have a right to escape from that law. And so... Uh, then one of the laws said, was that the agreement between us, Socrates, or was it to respect the judgment that the city came to? Now, very cleverly here, 
Socrates, using the voice of the laws, of course, has introduced quickly the two moral principles. He is saying, first of all, you're going to destroy the city. That certainly is harming. That certainly is doing harm. And second of all, now he says, the city the laws is saying, we had an agreement. And you're breaking the agreement. And the agreement was uh, had to do with uh, obeying the laws. The verdict of the court is a law. Therefore, at least has the effect of law. And so, uh, if you had an agreement to obey the law, and you now are breaking that agreement, we're, <laughs> you're over two on moral principles there. Uh, over two in the sense of you are attempting to cause harm, and you're also attempting to break an agreement. And if you do escape, you will cause harm, and you will break an agreement. That's what the, that's what the laws is saying. And so we're going to have you know, some sort of an argument here about whether uh, the laws is right, whether Crito is right, whether Socrates is right, or, um, or what. So we, we move on. And Socrates does not wonder what we say, but answer, since you're accustomed to proceed by question and answer. This is nice thing for Socrates. This often, even though he's speaking for the laws, is taking digs at himself. Uh, sort of thing, hey, you're a big Socratic method guy, why don't you answer? You're, you know, you're pretty good at asking questions, why don't you a bleeping answer for once? Socrates can sort of poke fun at himself, even on his uh, apparent deathbed. Come now, what accusation do you bring against us uh, and the city that you should try to destroy us? Did we not first bring you to birth? And was it not through us that your father married your mother and begat you? Tell us, do you find anything to criticize on those of us who are concerned with marriage? By those of us, means sort of the institutions, the social or political or whatever institutions in society in which uh, you meet, you, uh, you, you choose to marry, you get married, those kinds of things, whatever, whatever institutional structures the city has set in place, uh, you know, your, your parents got married, you were born, any problem with that? Uh, you know, any, any reason to think that something went wrong in that? And, and Socrates is saying, no, that's, that's fine. I would say I do not criticize them. Or in those of us concerned with the nurture of babies and the education that you two receive, were those assigned to that subject not right to instruct your father to educate you in the arts and the physical culture? In other words, you know, the tradition in the city was a, a father uh, raises his sons in the arts and the physical culture, maybe in, the, uh, in, in thinking and intellectual stuff. He says, uh, was this guidance that the city gave you not correct? Is this something that you, it was good for you to be educated this way? And Sock says, well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay too. Um, very well if it continued. And after we were born and nurtured, educated, could you in the first place deny that you are our offspring and servant, both you and your forefathers? So, just pause here for a minute, because now what the laws is doing is, is after having laid this groundwork about, you know, uh, marriage and giving birth and education, the laws is alluding, and it's going to be more than alluding, it's going to be pretty explicit in a minute, is alluding to the thought that in some sense, the city and its culture, the laws can mean not just the laws in the sense of a, uh, a set of statutes, but the laws mean something, uh, it's, it's a much more uh, a loose understanding of, let's say, the Constitution might be a good way of calling it. The Constitution, again, not a document as much as something like the ideals and the spirit of the city, and also the traditions of the city. And that's sort of, uh, these things combined together is what constitutes what Socrates is calling the laws. He's calling it the laws because I guess it's a simple thing, to, to a, a more simple way of saying it. But he's talking more about the institutions and traditions and, uh, uh, and the constitution in some sense of the city. So it's both social and political and you might say even historical. This, this conglomerate that we call the Athenian culture, uh, that, that's essentially who is speaking and saying that we raised you, we're your parents. I mean, you, you may have biological parents, but there are, and we're their parents too. And if we're their parents, and if we're your grandparents' parents, then uh, uh, if you have any respect for older generations, you have to recognize you've got to have a lot of respect for us. Because we are the parents of the oldest people in your family that you can trace back. We're still ahead of them. We're still behind them. And they owe us allegiance. And if you owe them allegiance, you sure as hell owe us allegiance. So it's a sense that there is another set of parents you have, or at least uh, your biological parents are important. There's nothing, nothing that we should say is, uh, is wrong about that. But also, the, 
the city or the, the culture, the tradition, it offers you as parents because it gives you a, a background, a framework, a context within which you were raised. And your values come from the city. Your values come from the tradition. Your values talk about being raised in the arts, being raised in physical culture, being raised in certain ways. I mean, you get your values a lot through these kinds of things. And these values came directly out of the common experience of people in that culture. And so uh, people have common values because they're raised in sort of common ways, in, at least I'd say in similar ways. So the, the loss is making case that if you believe it's important to obey your parents, which was in those days, and we are something like your parents, then it's important to obey us as well. And that's going to be a, a case that they're going to make. And uh, as he says there, are 51, about 51, A6, A5. Is your wisdom such as not to realize that your country is to be honored more than your mother, your father, and all your ancestors? And this is, sort of, again, the priority. If your mother and your father and your grandparents and your ancestors came from here as they did, and they owe the city the laws, the Constitution, they're going to call it, uh, the same allegiance as they would owe parents, then certainly you owe it as well. So you can't put family above country. That's not a point of view that many people hold perhaps today. Uh, uh, Socrates believes it's, it's, it's a position you have to hold or else you, you end up with a, a kind of a sort of self-interested self narcissistic chaos that he found around him there, or at least found around him in the democratic uh, part of this. So um, there's more to be revered, more sacred. It counts for more among gods and sensible men that you must worship it, yield to it, and placate its anger more than your father's. So this is it. I mean, the, the, this conglomerate that is uh, the tradition in which you were raised is more important than any of your family. And you must listen to it first. You must either persuade it or obey its orders and endure in silence whatever instructs you to endure. Now, the persuade or obey is going to come back a couple more times. So it's important to me to pause on that because uh, persuade or obey sounds like just sort of a throwaway line. But what the laws are saying is that that the city, the laws, the constitution offers you an opportunity. If you don't think things went uh, are right, if you think the laws are being misapplied, or if you think there's something unfair or unjust about the way things go in, let's say, in your particular case, you have an opportunity to persuade. That's in some sense what structures of government, particularly structures of government, are supposed to do. Give you an opportunity to appeal something if you think it went wrong for you, but if your appeal is denied, if you don't persuade well, then you must obey. You get the opportunity to persuade if you take, you know, if you take exception to what happens. But if uh, there is not enough flexibility in the, in the system to accommodate your complaint, then you must obey. Persuade or obey are two important things here because they're going to come back again. The laws are going to talk about that. And the laws are going to allude to the fact that Socrates, you had a chance to persuade. It was called your trial. You shot yourself in the ass. And now you're going to run away instead of accepting, obeying, what the court said. In your trial, you could have persuaded 501 people that you were not guilty of the crimes or that whatever you were trying to convince them of. But you went around preening and posturing and being so morally superior to everybody. Now, the law is not saying that. I'm just sort of doing my own interpretation. Uh, of, the, of the more vindictive laws or the sarcastic laws, but still, the laws can be sarcastic occasionally. It's okay, and and so he uh, he wasted his time. Socrates did, if he said, um, instead of trying to really persuade that these charges were bogus. Uh, and now he says and that, the, that the verdict of the laws has come down. You now want to run away. He said that was not the you know the agreement is. Persuade or obey. Uh, at uh, a little before, okay, at 51, about 51 C, about C6, reflect now, Socrates, the law that might say, that what we say is true. You are not treating us rightly by planning to do what you're planning. We have given you birth, 
nurtured you, educated you. We could have given, uh, we have given you and all the other citizens a share of all the good things we could. Even so, by giving every Athenian the opportunity after he has reached manhood and observed the affairs of the city and us the laws, we proclaim that if we do not please him, he can take his possessions and go wherever he pleases. Not one of our laws raises any obstacle or forbids him if he is not satisfied with us or the city. One of you wants to go and live in a colony or wants to go anywhere else and keep his property. So he's saying that once you get to the point of maturity, you have this opportunity. You have a chance to look around and say, man, am I going to be stuck in independence believing this story for the rest of my life? And then you can say, not a no, but hell no. And then you pick up your stuff and you go uh, to the wide open spaces of Green Valley. And or, or the, the, the important thing is that you're not locked in Athens, the law said. We gave you an opportunity, and you, you with no penalty, if you look around and say, I don't want to stay here, go, oh, fine. No harm, no foul. Take your property. I mean, you'll leave uh, and no longer be a citizen. You'll come back as an alien. You can't pretend that you'll go away and then come back and things will be fine. No. You make a choice, and you live with that choice. You make a choice to stay here, you live with that choice. So he says uh, that, is, we say, however, that whoever you remains, when he sees how we conduct our trials and manage the city in other ways, has in fact come to an agreement with us to obey our instructions. So here is sort of the basis of that agreement again. And this is a basis of something else in the history of philosophy, really a wonderful, uh, sort of really the first, let's say, secular example of, of this, which is uh, what's called social contract theory. Social contract theory is really pretty hot right, uh, right now, actually for about the last 40 or 50 years in uh, in uh, Western philosophy. Social contract theory has been one of the most dominant ways of trying to explain how political obligation comes about. How can we be obligated to obey laws? How can we, we be obligated to sacrifice a certain amount of our freedom in order to get the, let's say, the protection of the state and the benefits of the state? And social contract theories have been worked out by a lot of people. And this is really the first salvo of saying that in some sense there is something like an agreement. Lots of times social contract theory founders on at least uh, an initial criticism is, well, I didn't sign no contract with no city. Uh, you don't see my name in the, on any paper, and so therefore there is no contract. And what Socrates is explaining here, and he explains it as well as any contemporary philosopher did, how you can envision the idea, the concept of a contract, or the concept of an agreement to come about. It doesn't require an explicit signing of a paper and notarized by somebody. It's merely that we can see this as a de facto agreement that everyone who reaches an age of maturity and deliberates about where they want to be in life can decide to stay or go. If you stay, then you sign the contract. If you go, and maybe you live somewhere else, perhaps there's a contract there, a kind of implicit contract that exists as well. This is, again, sort of tough stuff. Uh, John Rawls and his great work, The Theory of Justice, is, a, is fundamentally a social contract book. Uh, there have been others as well. I'm going to bring their names out. I think one of the most important ones was John Locke in the Second Treatise of Government. Here, John Locke's <coughs> work, which was something of a social contract idea, was one of the founding philosophical documents of the American Revolution. Most of the great uh, revolutionaries of our country, uh, Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton, uh, Adams, had all read uh, John Locke, all memorized the Second a lot of what came out of the attitude toward and an understanding of how we need to move forward after the Revolutionary War came out of a lot of the ideas that, that John Locke first brought out in the Second Treatise. The Second Treatise is from about uh, 1680, not 1680 is when I think it was published. So we're talking about 100 years after Locke's Second Treatise. It's probably its greatest application in, in, in the real world was the application of building the American Republic. So it's, it's, a, it's a really nice thing. But social contract theory is an important thing that sort of Socrates is giving us the first glimpse at it. But it's uh, pretty much to his detriment. We say that the one who disobeys does wrong in three ways. First, because in us he disobeys his parents. Or the, we're now saying that the, the, the city or the laws of the Constitution is de facto your parents. So you disobey your parents, that's a no-no. Um, he does not try to obey, uh, persuade us to do better. So 
in doing that. You're not trying to persuade. You're disobeying your parents. You're not trying to persuade. And, uh, and, uh, and he says, uh, it does not obey us either. So we, you know, we, got, we got three things you're doing wrong here. And so the idea, he says, is that, uh, that in, in breaking your agreement, you are, uh, without attempting to, to persuade, or in, let's say, having attempting and having attempted and failed to persuade, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not good. The, uh, at B, 52B, uh, the laws have a few other things to say about Socrates, saying that, uh, that they may well say, Socrates, we have convincing proof that we in the city were congenial to you. You would not have dwelled here most consistently of all the Athenians if the city had not been exceedingly pleasing. You have never left the city, even to see a festival, nor for any other reason the military service. No, that's pretty, you never even takes a vacation. Socrates is a workaholic, like very few philosophers I ever knew. Uh, Socrates, he just he's there 24-7, being a philosopher, being in Athens. He said, you could have gone anywhere, looked around and said, hey, this town's better than my town. But you stayed here, you must have liked it so much. He says, in addition, uh, he says that uh, if you wanted to leave during the trial, you could have assessed your penalty in exile. You certainly would have gotten that. I mean, you, if you would have proposed exile instead of playing this Britannian game, then you would have, you know, you would have got the votes. You would have gone on exile. And as the law says, you could have done with the city's blessing. Now what you're doing, uh, uh, the same thing, but now with the city's curses behind you. Um, let's see, he has, uh, no, there is a sort of a pony line there at 53A. He says, you've been away, 53A2, you've been away from Athens less than the lame or the blind or the handicapped. <laughs> That's sort of a, uh, okay, maybe we shouldn't laugh at the handicapped, but still, the point is that, you know, even a blind man can find your way to the city gates quicker than, that, than Socrates can. So, uh, you know, just nice. And he, he finally says, or the, the, uh, the laws finally says there at about 53A8, the laws finally just is going to destroy the rest of Crito's arguments. It's just going to be one long paragraph in which Crito doesn't have a toga to his name after this. You're going to show that all the arguments that this, that, I mean, Socrates has already marginalized a couple of the arguments, the laws are going to destroy the rest. And there's nothing, you know, no other reason is going to be left to explain why Socrates ought to leave. Therefore, it seems like it will be that Socrates will stay. It says, for consider how, uh, what good you will do yourself or your friends by breaking our agreements and committing such a wrong. It's pretty obvious that your friends themselves will be in danger of exile, disfranchisement, and loss of property. So, you know, Crito was saying, oh, everybody would think what terrible people we are. We just, and the laws are saying, yeah, and if you do help him, you better get your ass out of here, too, because you're going to be the same trouble as him. You're going to lose your property, you're going to lose your citizenship, and you won't have any place to return to. So, you're going to help him? Fine. You better go with him, because you have no welcome back here in you know, what used to be your home. So, other than uh, Crito saying, oh, everybody will say bad things about it if you don't escape, the laws are saying that if you do escape, uh, uh, your ass is grass. Your friends, uh, every anybody helped you, had better be on the same boat. And uh, he says, if you go to uh, if you go to one of the nearby cities, Thebes or Megara, Thebes really just northwest of, of Athens, uh, both are well governed. You will arrive as an enemy to their government. Remember, uh, Crito says everybody are welcome. You're the great Socrates. You know, I got friends everywhere. No problem. He says, uh, all who care for the city will look upon you with suspicion as a destroyer of the laws. You'll also strengthen the conviction of the jury that they passed the right sentence on you. For anyone who destroys laws could easily be thought to corrupt the young and the ignorant. So he says, if you, you're going to go somewhere uh, that, that you know, is a nice place like Thebes, he says, you'll come not as the great Socrates, but as the escaped convict, as a person who deliberately and intentionally Put his own his own longevity ahead of the, the strength and the uh, the integrity of the of the laws and the city and the culture that gave him birth and uh, and he uh, also the law says if, are you what are you going to do when you get to one of these cities you're going to preach all about virtue and 
and, and how one, you know, how living a good life and things like that. You, a person who is a hypocrite and a betrayer of the very, you know, the very place you came from, how can you look yourself in the mirror, were there mirrors in those days? It doesn't matter. Uh, if, you know, if you do this kind of a thing, uh, you know, how are you going to occupy your time? You certainly can't do the same kind of talking about virtue and character because you will be an example of someone who has none. And uh, at 54A, talks about, well, what about the kids? Well, um, you're gonna, how are you going to bring up your kids? You're going to take them with you, are you? Okay, you better take them with you. Uh, but if you take, because they won't, they won't have any friends left here because all of your friends who would have taken care of them before are going to have to go into exile if you go into exile. So what are you going to teach your kids? You're going to teach your kids uh, uh, respect for law when you didn't. Are you going to teach your kids about uh, how wonderful the old man was when he's going to run out of town on a rail? I mean, what are you, what are you going to do? He says, and the laws say, but you know, if you take your punishment and, you, uh, and you, your life ends, you'll stay here and your friends will stay here. They can raise your kids and they can raise your kids to revere you, to uh, recognize you. Uh, that your duty to the city and your duty to the good was strong, but you're willing to take death as a, uh, as, as a natural consequence of it. So he is saying that you take your kids with you and you escape. It'll be bad for them. It'll be bad for everybody. Melanie. Well, he just goes ahead and leaves and stays in Athens. Because he's, he's got the death penalty and he's going to die in Athens. Well, he can't stay in Athens, that's for sure. Uh, everybody knows him, and everybody knows he's an escaped convict. Mm -hmm. So, unless he's going to, in fact, uh, there was an interesting thing, a little, uh, the law say, you know, are you going to have to disguise yourself to get out of Athens, and then uh, you can put on little shows in these cities, uh, like uh, uh, like uh, Thessaly, the, the Crito's favorite city, really was sort of like the Mogadishu of the, of the Mediterranean at the time, where everything was lawless and gang-ridden, and so it was going to be pretty much a place where, you know, uh, a calm and deliberate philosopher who is going to be a laughing stock. I mean, who the hell wants him around? And so you're going to have to sort of put on a little dog and pony show. So uh, he can't stay in Athens. And if he goes somewhere else, the laws are saying, uh, you really won't be trusted. And then in a, in a law abiding city, you won't be trusted because you destroy the laws. In a non law abiding city, you'll be a joke. You'll, you'll, be, a, uh, you'll be a fool. Uh, and that's what you want to do, be sort of a court jester to some uh, you know, some uh, tribal chief. Yeah, go right ahead, won't you? But, uh, that doesn't sound like what Socrates would be a, in the kind of life he would lead. Um, the final thing he, uh, the laws are saying to him here at about 54, a little before 54C, he says, as it is you depart, if you depart, after being wronged, not by us, the laws, but by men, and that's a point that comes up in some other works that Plato wrote about politics is that the best constitution, the best, uh, the best structure and framework uh, often runs afoul, not because it's a bad constitution, but because the people in positions of authority and power are, are just uh, not up to the task or maybe or even are corrupt or, or degraded. So he's saying, this is what happened to you. The system is good, the laws are good, the agreement is just, but uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of things happened that made the system, uh, because of the individuals inhabiting it, whether it's the jury, whether it's the prosecutors, but it been you, Socrates, as well. I mean, a part of what you did didn't help the system work. It helped, uh, it sort of helped you uh, have a chug along the hemlock near the end. So that he's saying you'll destroy the laws, but the laws aren't destroying you. It's, if something went wrong in the system, it was individuals in the system that facilitated it going wrong. But you won't be able to get back at them. You won't be destroying them when you destroy the laws. You'll be destroying the very structure that nurtured you and kept you alive and keeps us all alive. And so the laws are saying that if, if you really want to get back at, at something, don't get back at everything. Uh, and there's probably nothing you can do to get back at Socrates is convinced, Crito seems to be convinced, and the laws walk out the door, or whatever they do. So, that's Crito in, I don't know, an hour and five minutes. I think that was pretty good. I, 
actually did use a few adjectives. I think of using no adjectives. So the exam was 42 questions. I just went over. Uh, about 70% of the questions come from the text, about 30% from what I put on the board. And those are the questions on the board. I long meandering monologue about uh, good and evil. So all the questions will be about good and evil. So uh, bring the Scantron card. Have a very nice weekend. Uh, stay out of the snow. And I'll see you on Monday.